I'm now with Dr. Paul Nash, uh, printing historian, formerly of the Bodleian Library. Um, Paul, maybe you could just tell us a bit about how things were printed in this period. Yeah, certainly. Well, it would all have been hand printing on a wooden hand press, which would have been built by a carpenter. And everything that was printed at that stage was set in metal type with decorations added with woodcuts. Uh, and two men would have operated each printing press. One was called a beater and the other a puller. And the beater would have inked the form, which contained the type and the blocks. And the puller would have placed the paper on and then operated the press to make the impression. And the, the beater would have become inky, would have got inky fingers, and the puller would have remained clean and handled the paper, and so it wouldn't have got marks on the paper. Um, the printing of broadsides, proclamations in particular, was a particular sort of um, uh, operation which differed from book printing in some ways. When you were printing a book, you would very often print maybe two or three hundred copies of a sheet on one side and then turn it over and print the other side. This was, of course, printing on half a sheet, usually, uh, just on one side. And also, the edition sizes were likely to be much bigger. Mm -hmm. A book, as I say, you might have printed one, two, three hundred, four hundred copies of a popular book. But these would probably have been printed in thousands. And so it was uh, something that had to be done um, very quickly, um, because the information had to be got out very quickly. And so very large numbers would have been printed. And sometimes they would have set up the same text uh, twice and printed it on two presses at the same time in order to speed things along. The, the process would have been um, sometimes simplified as well, in that you would have had on a book printing press something called a timpan and a frisket, which was a kind of sandwich which held the paper in position while it was being printed. But quite often with this sort of printing they would have got rid of that because it was quicker not to work with the timpan and frisket, and simply to have inked the form and dropped the paper onto the form and then pulled the impression. And for that reason you sometimes get proclamations that are skewiff mm -hmm. or have ink on the edges where it picked it up from the form. Shall we look at some examples of peculiarities in the printing? Yes, yeah. Um, this is a, a nice pair of examples. What you have here is a typical layout of the proclamation, and the way they were set was very um, symbolic in the sense that they all had to represent the authority, uh, and they had to get across the information. But they didn't have to be very well printed, and what you tended to have was um, a woodcut device of some sort of the head, some large lettering, large size of type with the words, in this case, an act, just to catch the eye, and then usually um, a decorative woodcut initial or a factotum. And a factotum is a piece of um, cut wood with a decorative um, design and a hole in the middle into which a piece of printing type could be put. So in this case, it's a B. And what's interesting about these two is that they're from two different periods. This is from uh, the Rump Parliament, and this is from after the Restoration. Very similar in layout, but of course, well, they had rather different uh, uh, devices at the head, but they used apparently the same woodcut factotum. This one was printed in 1650 and this in 1661. Although, in fact, if you look very closely at the woodcut factotum, you can see that this one is very damaged, it's got a lot of breaks in the border, and it's obviously been used a great deal, a great many, many thousands of impressions have been taken from this. And by the time that this can be printed, a little more than 10 years later, that block was no doubt too damaged to reuse, and so they've recut it. Although this block is the same image, it's actually a recut woodcut. It's not the same uh, block that was used here, although it does look very similar. It's a simple copy of it. That sort of thing happened a great deal, particularly in printing this kind of quick, cheap, uh, long impression um, work. Moving on to the next one, this is interesting because it doesn't have a, it's a slightly different layout. It doesn't have the woodcuts of the head. It was issued uh, again by the Parliament in 1649, the Grunt Parliament. Um, and, but it does have a decorative border. Um, this is, I think, to help catch the eye. But one of the interesting things about this border is how badly it's put together. It's, it's arranged with a series of what are called florons, type ornaments, which are arranged into this rectangular frame, but they don't quite fit, so they've had to um, put one or two other odd characters in to make it fit. And there's a curly bracket there, a brace, and another curly bracket in a different size brace there, and then there's a, a single line there, which is probably a rule, just to make the whole thing fit. So it's an example of the sort of cheapness of the production, but it was put together very quickly and carelessly. Moving on to the next one, this is an example of, you can see here, uh, this is a royal proclamation from 1677, a few years later, you've got the royal arms back again, the factotum is present, but what's interesting here is that you can actually see a piece of um, spacing material which has risen up between two of the characters here in the name of Charles. 
um, and of course every space that was put together to make up a form um, was a physical piece of type um, in the same way that each of the letters was, it just didn't have a letter on it, it was a blank as it were. And in this case you can see it's written up and, and inked, and the word Charles is letter space, that is the same as letter space from the next one, as large type tends to be, and in this case you can actually see the piece of type printing. There are a number of other pieces of type that have risen up. Again, it's a sign of the carelessness of the printing uh, and, and of printing, but this is a really good example because it happens to fall in the name Charles um, right at the beginning of the text. This next one is a nice example of poor printing again, in that what you've got here on the edge is an area which hasn't been properly inked. So you can see a very faint grey impression of part of the type. This is simply because the ink wasn't put correctly onto the form. Ink would have been applied with inking balls, which were leather pads, which were uh, inked by the beta, and he would then work them over the surface of the form with a, a, a circular motion. But he did it too quickly, he would miss bits, and that's clearly what happened here, in the hurry to get the thing printed. Um, this part of the form was not properly inked, and also the top of the woodcut here wasn't properly inked either. So this is really quite a bad impression. And you can also see um, the cheapness of the paper. There was no need to use a good quality paper for this sort of thing. It just needed to be um, strong enough to print on and to, to post somewhere. Uh, and you can see some damage to the um, printing because there's a, a crease in the paper here, which has actually affected one of the lines, makes it really rather difficult to read. The same is also true of this next one, which is a bit later on. We're moving into the 18th century now, 1701. Um, this represents some really bad printing in lots of ways. Not only do you have some creases in the very poor quality paper, the printing itself isn't very good, the inking of this woodcut factotum is terrible, but you also have the wrong date. It's been misdated MDDCI instead of MDCCI. Um, so um, that, I suppose, is 2101, <laughs> like the, uh, 1701. Of course, that wouldn't have mattered because everyone reading this, it would have been 1701 when you were reading it, so you wouldn't have known, you wouldn't have thought it was misdated there, and of course the date 1701 appears directly there. But it's again an example of carelessness on the part of the printer to have misset that date and not to have noticed, to have kept it um, like that, so that it, uh, it, it was printed in the form with, with this nonsensical uh, Roman date here. This next one um, is still later. This is, uh, takes us to 1712, and again, we've got some poor quality printing and poor quality paper with creases, which has affected the legibility of it. But what's really interesting here is that you have a press figure, bottom left here, and that's a little number, and there are a number of impressions and editions of this particular proclamation, which must have been printed in a very large number, on at least two different presses, because press figures which are something that confuse bibliographers a lot, um, partly because they seem to have been used in different ways by different printers. But they were usually used to represent either a press crew or a particular printing press. And so the fact that different um, editions of this proclamation appear with different press figures suggests that they were all printed by the same person, John Bastick, but on different presses. And the, the number represents the press that was used to print that. And quite possibly it was a case of simultaneous printing in order to produce a large number of copies. And this final one is lovely because it really um, makes the point of the, the, the human element in printing. It's really quite well printed, this one. It's taking us back to 1679. It's, it's really nicely impressed. Um, uh, the, the woodcut but, uh, arms and factotum are both well printed. But what's really lovely here is that you have a curly hair um, which has been caught in the ink there and, and held by the ink when it dried. And it must have belonged to either the beater or the puller when they were working this particular form in the press, that hair must have fallen from their heads and, and got caught there and has remained there as a, as a sign of the, the human hand or the human head anyway that was, that was working over this particular bit of printing. Thank you very much Paul. I wonder actually, could you just maybe finish by saying something about how these kind of texts were then disseminated? Yes, well once they had been printed they would have been um, stacked up in very large um, piles of thousands of sheets and then they would have been sent out around the country. Uh, some would have been posted up, uh, they would have been put in public places, marketplaces and in public buildings such as churches, uh, but some would also have been sold. There was a certain trade in these and indeed a few of them actually have a price printed on the bottom, usually a penny, so you could actually buy a copy of the, um, of the um, proclamation if you wanted to and uh, they, they hoped to distribute them all in this way. Um, and so that everyone who was literate would have a chance to read it. Thank you very much. Okay.